Oh, wait, this is not a guitar video. This is a horror video. See, guys, over here at JT's Horror Discussions, you get all kinds of content. You get horror talk most of the time. You have guitar and music videos. You get music recommendations. You also get interviews with upcoming and established directors and writers, actors and actresses in the horror genre. You also get some Dark Souls and gaming streams. All here on JT's Horror Discussions. So thanks for joining us for our 600th episode. I don't know who the fuck that guy was, but... Alright guys, welcome to the 600th video on this channel. So I was thinking long and hard if I wanted it to be something good. Like, at least something I've seen before. Excuse me, and I know it's a classic. Not take a gamble on something. So, I put this poll up, and surprisingly... Not too surprisingly, but... I thought uh, Conjuring would get a few more. And that was kind of the one I threw in there just as a... Alright, let's just see how many people vote for this. Not as much as I would think. Like, Phantasm came in third place, Phantasm 2. So, that movie's coming, like, tomorrow or the next day. Like, I gotta finish up the Phantasm series, and I'm excited to watch them all. And... Poltergeist almost beat... Um... Not this movie, because like always, <laughs> I just went ahead and picked my own movie. But I am doing, um, the winner of the poll was not Poltergeist. It was not Phantasm 2. It was, however, the likely underdog, David Cronenberg's Scanners, which excellent movie an absolute classic an absolute masterpiece and my probably my favorite Cronenberg now Cronenberg's not a director that I'm too big on like I've seen a decent amount of his movies I haven't seen all his movies I still haven't seen Shivers that's one I have to check out but I will save this for the Cronenberg uh, video later on today that I will be doing on the winner of the poll Scanners so until then, for my 600th episode, I wanted to do something with the six in it, which you only can get what you get. So there's a six in it, six zero zero. Pretend if you time six three times, you know, six, six, six. And this movie is Mario Bava's Lisa and the Devil from 1974. Now, I always go back and forth on my favorite Bava film. And it's always the same three movies in the top three that just kind of rotate around from first to second to third to second to first to third to first to second. And those are Kill Baby Kill, Lisa and the Devil, and actually just like four. Because I would have to say Black Sunday. And... Twitch of the Death Nerve. So four that are always rotating. But when I really look back and I try to just really think about my favorite Baba film, it's between this and Kill Baby Kill. And usually, depending on which one I'm watching or just watched, that's my favorite. Like, it's so hard to pick a favorite Baba film. Because, in my opinion, he didn't have a fall-off like Fulci and Argento and Carpenter and Craven. Like, most of them in the early 90s or in the 90s started going downhill. Baba never went downhill. And <clears throat> every movie I see by this guy is an absolute masterpiece. So, Lisa and the Devil is a movie starring... What is her name? It's, it's going to kill me if I don't check real quick. Because I know her name. Oh, what the hell is it? Elka, Elka Summer, that's it. And she plays the titular Lisa. And what is on my plug? Oh, okay, cool. She plays the titular Lisa character. And she is a tourist who is in Italy. And she ends up seeing this painting or mural of the devil, let's say. Like, it's supposed to be the devil. And ends up going to try to get to the hotel she's staying at, where her friend is. And 
man, it's been like, like a year or two since I've seen this, but she ends up getting, she ends up being trapped basically, like uh, on the side of the road, gets picked up by um, a couple, and they have a flat tire or something, and then they have to go inside this house for the night, and they meet the uh, countess there and her son Maximilian. And this is definitely Baba's, at least from all of Baba's movies I've seen, which is most of them. I think the only ones I haven't seen are like a spaghetti western ones. But damn, man, like this movie is definitely the most out there for me. Like it's definitely the most ambiguous. It's the most abstract feeling. It's surreal. It feels like a dream. Like, kind of like an Italian Lynch feeling to it, in a way. And just all the performances are great in this. Like for even though with the dubbing and stuff, still good. Like everyone does a great job. And just the atmosphere this movie has is so surreal. Like I said, it's so nightmarish. It's like a fever dream. And it's absolutely excellent. And just all the, th- the theories that you can go on with this movie of what are the, the dummies represent. Who is, um, oh, what the hell is his name in this? Leonardo or something? Or Lena? I'll, fi- I'll find out. But um, the, who plays the, guy, the butler who ends up possibly being the devil which is heavily heavily implied that he is there's a lot of places you can go with questions for that so we'll talk about that near the end but let's talk mario bava's amazing amazing film from 1973 or 74 yeah 74 because after exorcist because that's the next thing lisa and the devil now, the reason I just said 73 was The Exorcist, keep in mind, just came out like a year or less before this movie was, was finished. And look at the impact The Exorcist had. Absolutely insane impact that that movie had on everybody, especially in the horror genre, of course. So when this movie came out, they wanted to capitalize on the popularity of The Exorcist. So they actually filmed extra scenes with a priest played by Robert Alda, who is the father of Alan Alda from MASH, who is my mother's first cousin. So, yeah, we have a little bit of a celebrity in our family. Alan Alda from MASH is my mom's first cousin, and her uncle was Robert Alda, and he plays the priest in in the cut known as the House of Exorcism, which is where we have all the cuts of the extra scenes with Robert Alda playing the priest, and we have... um, I haven't seen the House of Exorcism cut in a while. I think we have her, uh, Lisa's character, in the hospital... And, like, she's possessed, and she's retelling the story of how she got possessed, and that's all the footage from, like, the original film, like, at the house and everything. Something like that, but it's not that good. Like, this cut, the regular Lisa and the Devil, all the way. Like, don't even bother with House of Exorcism. Unless, like, you've seen this movie, and you love Lisa and the Devil, and want to see, like, how different it is and compare it. That's the only time I'd say you can check it out. And I have a relative in there, and I don't care to watch it ever again. So (laughs) it's not that good. But Lisa and the Devil, fantastic. First, I also, I got to say that um, the Kino transfers that are all the ones that it seems to be all the Mario Baba films on Amazon Prime, because I know uh, A Bay of Blood was was Kino, Um, Kill Baby Kill was, uh, Blood and Black Lace, last I watched, was... So it seems like all of them are the Kino transfers, and they look fucking marvelous, man. Like, these transfers look so good. These movies look so great. Like, the cin- like blanket as usual, with the, all the directing, the, the, the editing, the sound design, everything is fucking perfect in this movie. Absolutely fantastically done. So everything that goes into the process of filmmaking is absolutely amazing in this whole film. 
and there's just such so many great shots and just such great atmosphere that like confuses you it makes you feel uneasy but at the same time keeps your intrigue and like really you start getting into like what the hell is going on and you're trying to figure it out and it just keeps on getting weirder and weirder and <laughs> it's it's definitely like a rabbit hole like alice down the uh you know down the rabbit hole type situation movie like for sure and god do i love it even just the uh the opening credits with the cards and stuff and the music playing over that great score in this movie too like love the score in Lisa and the devil now it's produced by alfred leone who i'm pretty sure also produced barren blood which is another movie i got of mario bava's i gotta cover on. i gotta do all the rest of mario bava's films i know i've done twitch of the death nerve aka bay of blood how could i not i did the first day of slasher september because <laughs> it's for me the first slasher film um Kill Baby Kill, because that for me is the best ghost haunting film. <laughs> this guy has created so many genres. Like, not so many, but he basically invented the giallo with the girl who knew too much. Or you could say Blood and Black Lace, he perfected it. And then he, he basically molded and shaped what would become the slasher genre with uh, Bay of Blood or Twitch of the Death Nerve, which is such a fucking better title like that is one of the best titles ever for a horror movie twitch of the death nerve are you serious and they change it to a bay of blood for overseas like oh that's like just one movie that the perfect title i mean a bay of blood's fine there is a lot of blood there is a bay that's the whole setting but still man twitch of the death nerve that's so much better now as usual for bava the the color looks so rich in this movie it looks so good the lighting looks impeccable like as always i mean kill baby kill in my opinion is his best usage of color and lighting like it's just unreal in that movie like every single shot like has different color on the it's unbelievable like how they do that but this movie is no slouch like absolutely great lighting and great usage of color and just the way that it looks the cinematography is fantastic in this movie all right so we open up with lisa and her friend who are visiting italy i want to say i'm not sure where in italy i'm guessing rome which i mean it looks like rome i've been to to rome it does look like rome but um they they're visiting somewhere and <laughs> they end up uh, with a tour guide, and the tour guide is showing, in like this little fresco, showing a mural or a painting on the wall, on like, it's like a concrete, and uh, then painting over it, and it shows the devil, what's supposed to be like the human representation of the devil, and it's a creepy look, too, like it's a creepy picture, and it's creepier that the actor looks just like it, or, well, obviously they made the drawing after the actor, but he does look like, he looks like he could be the devil. Like, this actor. Like, I forget his name. But I believe it. Like, when when they start... When you start getting the, the idea that this guy might be the devil, and then, like, pretty much get confirmation at the end... Yep. Sounds about right. Like, he really looks like someone who could be. Like, if there's anyone human-looking who looks like the devil, it's this fucking guy. Like, a hundred percent. So, they're looking at the painting, and the tour guide says that this even led to a superstition, like, in this region, regarding, you know, that it's, there's a curse, or that the devil walks among them, or something like that. And Lisa ends up leaving her friend for a little bit. She said she'll be right back, and she starts walking around the town a little bit. Man, all the gorgeous antiques in this place that she's walking into... God, I'd kill for some of that stuff. Like, I love antiques and shit. My parents used to like them too, mostly my dad. But maybe that's why. But I love some of the stuff in this place. And then she sees the guy who looks like the fucking devil. And she gets already just like a weird feeling just from him looking at her. First of all, love the score playing in this scene. And then when she looks at it lienzo his name is when he look when she looks at lienzo for the first time and then like he's the way that he films it and just zooms in on his face a little and then you get the overlay of the painting of him 
like in the square overlaid over his face for a minute and then like it comes off awesome and then just the, the, the feeling of fear and everything that you can feel from her and she doesn't know why but like it, she's just ear like it's eerie that this guy looks just like the devil in the painting she was just looking at and he's there with the carlos uh dummy which we find out later is Car, the, actually Carlos like reincarnated or something we'll talk about the ending at the end because there's a whole bunch of questions so and I know these are the type of videos that don't get a lot of views I mean there's not a lot of people into Italian horror like as much compared to you know like American horror like like for sure so that alone like I know these type of videos Italian horror videos are not my best uh, viewed videos but the people who love Italian horror always there gotta give them that and that's because it's the shit <laughs> and fucking italy was making some of the best horror like in the 60s 70s and 80s but um oh the colors just look like, like her green jacket that she's wearing it just it looks fucking great like it looks so rich in color like the green like it so good the coloring and everything in this movie i love also in that scene with when she first sees lienzo and when they overlay the, the picture the painting over him i love how the sound the the music that was playing drops out and sound drops out for the most part uh, then it comes back in that little bell like ding, ding, ding. awesome how they do that too like it's like she is fully engrossed in in a trance almost looking at him that nothing else she doesn't hear or see anything else and he convey he conveys that so well it looks it's such a great scene when she first meets him so she ends up getting lost after uh that uncomfortable meeting with lienzo and she starts walking t throughout the town and trying to find her way asking for directions and man just all the cobblestone and everything it's so beautiful uh, and just the whole line after that like when she's walking out and he's there laughing and the shopkeeper is like oh that girl weird or strange strange that girl you think she'd seen the devil great so funny it's actually a terrifying thought i mean if you believe in hell and the devil and heaven and god and all that stuff which i do not but just just the thought like if there was a devil being able to just like meet him in human form in a store and then just leave and you never would have known never will know that you just met the devil like that's a, that's a scary thought <laughs> you know that the devil could be anybody like if it could take a human form it could be anyone and you could be shaking hands with the devil sooner than you think boom and yeah, though, the sound design is fucking fantastic, too. Just everything. This movie's perfect. This is a perfect, another perfect masterpiece of mine. Like, absolutely. And the sound design is fantastic. Like, when you, she's walking through the town, just her footsteps on the cobblestone. And then you hear the laughter. And just, <laughs> and it just in the headphone, it sounds so good. Like, all of it sounds fantastic. And then what a creepy scene. What a great scene this is, man. I love this. When Lienzo comes and he's carrying Carlos' dummy. And he's talking to himself or whatever. talking. Who knows who he's talking to. But then he walks into Lisa while she's lost. And... Excuse me. I don't know why I got fucking burping. But probably... I'm in a soda, that's why. I never drink soda, really, anymore. Like... And this has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> All right, so Lisa is lost, and Lienzo like runs into her and says, "Like, ah, it's the lady we saw in the shop." And she says, "You know, I'm lost. Like, can you tell me where the the main square is?" And he at first is like, "What main square?" And like, kind of disorients her even more. And then she's standing at. I mean, I swear this is what it looks like. That there's a wall behind her. And then she says, you know, the one with the uh, fresco, the, the painting with the devil carrying away the dead. And he says, ah, that way. And then she turns around and there's a path behind her that wasn't there before. Right? Like, it's, I've seen this movie a handful of times. I always, that's what I, that's what it looks like. Unless the way that 
it filmed like right before it shows him pointing his head towards the pathway and saying there, and then it shows that there's a path behind her. It's shot just at a weird angle, and there's the path behind her the whole time, but it looks like he made a path appear. It's exactly what it looks like. So, and that's how I've always taken it. But awesome scene. Like, so creepy. Like, you could feel just, like, you could feel this woman's fear, like, throughout this whole movie. It's so well done, making you feel just, like, trapped and, like, scared and shit. Like, this is a wild, wild movie. Like, for sure. Like, if anyone's watching this, for some reason, who hasn't seen the movie, stop and rent the movie. I don't think it's streaming anywhere. Maybe it is in other countries besides the U.S., but it's not in the U.S. anywhere. But you can rent it on Amazon Prime, whatever, for like two bucks, three bucks. Rent it and watch it. Because, god damn, I love this movie. Every time I watch it, I get so happy. I love that doorway she walks through that's kind of like cut out like this with a circle on the top. Look, the architecture and everything looks fantastic. And then we see Carlos, who looks just kind of like the dummy that Lanzo was carrying, or the devil, quote-unquote. And he comes up and he's calling her Elena. And he's saying, Elena, like, Elena, Elena, whatever, screw you. Elena, like, I've waited so long, like, I I'm, I'm, can't believe you're here again, like, we can finally be together again, and, so, and she's, like, freaking out, like, who the hell is this person? And she ends up accidentally, like, pushing away from him, and he falls down the stairs, and looks like he's dead, and it has this cool little uh, pocket watch that it gets a nice little uh, zoom in on shot on. I love that little watch, it looks so cool. I want that damn watch! So, Lisa... Uh, ends up meeting um, a car, a couple, and their driver, George, whose car was giving them trouble. And she says that she's lost, she's a tourist, and they say to hop in. And they head on to this house that this is where they end up having to go for the night because they can't get the car fixed till the next morning or something like that. And this is where they're going to meet the Countess and her son, Maximilian. I also love just how you can feel her paranoia. Like, this is, you feel a lot of paranoia in this movie. Like, Baba just was so amazing at capturing just that feeling of just, like, just like how the characters stare into the distance and, like, they're giving her short answers at the beginning and just, like, it's making her more and more anxious, more and more uneasy, and it kind of rubs off on you as a viewer, and it kind of makes you start feeling uneasy, like what a fucking master Bob was. Oh, man, and then just the shots when uh, they, they're right in front of the door the, with the car, and they can't go any further, and they say they gotta stop here and use the phone, and Lienzo opens the door, and the shots of him just standing in the doorway, and just the zoom-in shots, and just how it's looking at Lisa, and then it's looking at Lienzo, like, creepy, man. Uh, then she just turns around, and she sees Maximilian out of nowhere. And handsome guy, like, nice features, blue eyes, like, she could f fall instantly in love with this guy. And I like how this movie, like, uh, since spoilers, obviously, I feel, I love with this movie how it's, like, almost like an endless love story like a tragic love story on repeat to fail every time over and over again because it's I've always taken it and more on this at the end obviously but always taking it that this is a loop that they pretty much relive their deaths over and over again so we'll talk more on that later and the whole path that they have to go to, to the other house, like the guest house, with the bridge they go over, then, like, the shots, it's at nighttime, but, like, the shots in the reflection, and then just the way that the the statue with, like, the podiums around it, like a little gazebo, but with columns, and there's a statue in the, in the middle of it, the way it's lit, and every, it, it looks so fucking fantastic. Like, the cinematography, I can't praise enough in this movie. Like, it looks so good. Same with Kill Baby Kill by Baba. And Blood and Black Lace. And Black Sunday. And, like, it, it, <laughs> Baba is in a league of his own, man. He really is. I like how Lienzo immediately acknowledges Lisa. 
and says like I miss like you remember like we met in town you asked for directions and she's at first says no and he's like yeah I, I'm often in town for the countess and I like how he like it's kind of like the devil coming up to you before playing a game with you and saying like hey just letting you know like you know like you know like acknowledging your presence kind of winking at you without you knowing anything I don't know I like I, I like that I also like that Lienzo is the one who shuts the gates to the property and puts the chain and lock around it. Same thing, like he's the devil and now they're in his realm and he's shutting them out from the outside world. Like so much, there's so much imagery and just stuff that you can go diving into with this movie, like with most bother films. Here's a quick topic that's not going to work for everybody, but here it goes. <laughs> Is it just me? Is like when I watch older films like like this, like from the early seventies or the sixties and stuff, or earlier, it just seems like this people were so much classier back then. Like there's none of the bullshit people we have today that just bitch nonstop about everything and just like just carry themselves in terrible ways and like everyone just looks so much cl more classy back then. So much more respectful. So much, like, all of that. Like, people, I feel like humanity, well, I mean, definitely is going to hell. Like, we're on a, we're on the path real soon. Like, we're on the path already. It's happening soon. We're on a fast dive. Like, a few more decades I give the human race. Seriously. And then, pff, we're done. But, I don't know, just the way that, that he was just like filming Lisa and Maximilian talking or Maximilian and the other woman uh, who has the husband. And it just made me think of it, and I, which I think often watching older films. Like, it's just like, man, like the world was so much more, like people were so much more respectful to each other and stuff back then. Just an aside note for you. And then she goes to the room that she's going to stay in and she freaks out when she sees the pocket watch on the floor, smashed up from Carlos, the guy in town that she accidentally killed. <laughs> and she starts bugging, which anybody would. I mean, now, like, what do you do? Now she thinks, like, somebody saw her and that she's going to get arrested for killing this guy. Like, that's what she's thinking. She has no idea <laughs> how much worse things are about to get than the possible uh, charge. <laughs> for killing somebody by accident, manslaughter. And then Lisa sees uh, Carlos on the outside the window creeping, like with his hand opening the window slowly, and she's trying to get out the front door, and she does, and then she starts running away, and again, all the, just, all the, all the fucking outdoor shots just look absolutely mesmerizing in all of Bob's films, but for now, just here. So good throughout this whole film. And then she runs into Maximilian, and he says, no, no, it's only Leandro. And then she looked, turned around, and she sees it's Leandro carrying the dummy of Carlos. Fucking with her mind and stuff. Like, <laughs> love it. Love it so much. Love it. Yeah, I love it. I love it, and I love that. Combined equals it. So <laughs> we got a new word again. It is it. T-H-I-T. So, you owe me for that, too. Two? I don't know. But I love that. Like, I love how the, him as the devil could basically fuck with our mind, could do whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> like, it, it's, there's, and there's some fucked up stuff in this movie. Like, a little towards the end, like, with the, um, with him in bed with the corpse of Elena, that's some disturbing shit. Oh, Francis and Sophia is the uh, husband and wife with George, their driver. Yeah. Because, yeah, the Countess comes down, and Maximilian's like, oh, mother, so glad you came down. And they have a very weird relationship, like, borderline incestual, like, in a way. I don't know, it's strange. It's been, like I said, a, f a few year or two or three, maybe, like, years since I've seen this last. So I could be remembering, like, more so than it actually hints at, but I do remember that. You gotta admit, though, the devil may be the devil, but he's nice enough to cook you a nice dinner first. 
I love when uh, Sophia is talking and we have that close up shot that pans in close closer onto uh, the Countess's eyes and then it just zooms out real quick when you hear the uh, noise in the attic with the statue falling over. Awesome shot. And then Maximilian's mother, the Countess, starts saying that he's back and he's back while looking upstairs and says that she hasn't been introduced to the fifth guest. There's only four. <laughs> Sophia, Francis, George and Lisa. So we know that the other one is, you know, Car the whole affair story between Carlos and the Countess and went for Maximilian, or um, not Maximilian, for uh, Elena. Is it a very decent plot in here, but it's very convoluted. So I can definitely see this movie confusing the shit out of people. Because this is a movie that even, same with the Phantasm movies, that. I'll, I've seen them much more than this movie. I've seen the Phantasm series a lot. But every t single time while I'm watching it and after I watch it, I still don't know half of what the fuck just happened. <laughs> That's how this movie makes me feel too. And I love it for that. And I love the, the top-down shot of the dinner table in the dining room while they're eating. Looks awesome. Yeah, then uh, Maximilian just going into the room where he keeps Elena, like her corpse, and starts saying, and he brings her ice cream with chocolate sprinkles, he says. <laughs> I love that. He says, I brought you your favorite with chocolate sprinkles. Like, oh, extra. Awesome. And then the sheet's over, so you don't know who it is at the time, and you think he's just crazy or that it's an actual person in there. And says that um, you're not asleep, and he's yelling at this corpse, <laughs> saying, do you know um, that he was back? Meaning Carlos, like, sick man but they're all in like a purgatory hell situation so I, I cut him slack so then George the driver was working on the car with some tape and he says tell uh, to Leandro's out there too with him says go tell the others like I'll be ready to go in a little bit in a few minutes and he goes to tell them and that's a cool suit that uh, Maximilian sporting right there I don't know if I could if I could rock it, but I like I like it. Then we have the cool scene of Maximilian yelling out at uh, Carlos. So we don't know anything about Carlos yet, and said and saying, uh, "Show yourself! Like, how can I fight you? Or like, or if I can't even see you? Like, cool little scene, little little overacting." The Countess, though, she does a great job. Like, she she uh, looks pretty fucking creepy throughout this movie. Uh, in case I didn't say, she's blind, the Countess. I don't know why Sophie freaks out. Like, she doesn't freak out, but, like, her reaction to finding out that the Countess is blind, she's like, oh, God, she's blind. Like, whoa, like, all right, like, so she's blind. <laughs> like, she, like, literally gets up from her chair. Like, why is it so shocking? And then she's, like, standing behind her husband. Like, that's fucking weird behavior. And then after getting descriptions of her from uh, touching her hair and her face and stuff, and uh, Lienzo saying she has uh, blue eyes, changeable eyes, but by the uh, fireplace, it's blue. And she ends up leaving, but then turns around and says, like, I told you to stay away from this place. Like, now it's too late. And then we see the drawing of her in a diary or something, a book that uh, Maximilian has. So we see... Her in the book, so there's some sort of doppelganger stuff going on in this movie. That, like, Lisa's the doppelganger of Elena, or reincarnated, or more, like I said, that we'll talk near the end. But that's pretty much the theme that I've always taken, the idea I've always taken from it, and the theme running through this. was just reflection, and reflecting your inner self, and literally having a reflection, a doppelganger that she takes the place of, or has the same fate as, something like that. Oh, that's right, right? And then we find out that, um, pretty sure, if I remember correctly, we find out a little bit that Sophie was having an affair with George, the driver, behind her husband's back. Yeah, yeah, that happened. Like I said, the score is amazing. Like, I love this, the song that played at the beginning. I think it's the same song, and then this one plays uh, when she's walking, like, in a dream with the veil and the, um, little 
like gazebo with columns is there and she's like this again the outdoor shots again look fucking phenomenal and this is in the daytime so different look but awesome just the same and that the song playing during that with the female vocals beautiful and that's creepy man like she has is having this dream that she is uh elena and carlos and stuff it comes and they start making out and and they're together and then next thing they know uh she's in bed hugging him kissing him with carlos and i'm guessing she's like elena at this time like visioning like having a vision or dreaming that she's elena is what it's heavily implying but then like in real life like she's thinking of dancing and like making out with maximilian and then she opens her eyes and it's carlos so i don't know what the fuck happens in this last sequence <laughs> i've been talking about actually like she's having a thought or a vision or a memory as of elena elena whatever and then she's hooking up with maximilian there and then he changes to carlos so i'm just gonna guess that she saw carlos Ooh, Frank, man, he drops that S-L-U-T bomb on his wife, calls her a slut, because he knew what was going on between her and George, and then they open the door of the car, and he falls out, and, like, his neck was cut or something like that, and you get a shot of uh, bloody scissors. I mean, no kill, but the aftermath is cool. And then, I mean, sad, man. I mean, uh, uh, what the hell's her name now? Uh, Sophie, it, they all uh, bring the body in George's body and and into the house. And then she's crying hysterically. Like she's, she, it makes you feel fucking bad for her. <laughs> like she's putting on a good good performance. So Leandro brings up that um, the mother, the Countess, you know, was imagining that there was a fifth guest, and then they show you see a few shots of uh. Carlos in the house uh, then you start to realize and the first time seeing this movie you start thinking all right so this is he might be the fifth guest whether he's a ghost or what's up with there's so many thoughts that can run through your head the first time watching this movie and so many places that it could go from like the half hour mark 45 minute mark to where it does that's what I love about this is that there's just so many avenues of discussion you can go down with this movie and then the Contessa, she goes and uh, cock blocks her son from Lisa, you know, with Lisa when they're in the, uh, you know, on the ground walking around at night. And Contessa ends up uh, whisking Maximilian, her son, away and uh, over babying the shit out of him. And then Carlos appears to Lisa and starts talking to her saying that all right just meet me and blah blah blah, blah and i will explain everything and i, I want to uh, whisk you away from here and uh, then she ends up spying on leandro and he takes the like it looks like a wreath or something off of the casket and it's carlos's body and uh, then she turns around she's carlos and now she's freaking that she's seen a ghost and she's running into the house and up the stairway like <laughs> He's absolutely losing it, and who would who could blame her? I love Francis's line when uh, Sophie's crying over uh, George's body, and he's like, "If you're finished crying over your lover, we can leave." <laughs> That's hysterical, and I like how they keep showing as the movie goes on uh, a few shots so far, zoom in on the emblem statue on the end of the, on the hood of the car. <laughs> well, then they're leaving, and she says uh to frank she's like i'm not going with you like i'm staying here till george is buried and he's like getting in the car and she gets in the car and then he goes to cross in front to get to his side and she just hops in the driver's seat puts it in go and just fucking runs him over (laughs) repeatedly like a lot like (laughs) puts him reverse goes back hits him goes forward go back Puts in reverse, goes and hits over him, goes forward, hits him, goes in reverse, goes back. Like, <laughs> she fucking hated her goddamn husband, man. Oh, I love the shot when um Carlos is leaning over Lisa 
while she's sleeping and Sophie runs in and then she's like, wait, and then uh, somebody we don't know yet with the pipe comes down or a metal something and hits uh, Carlos over the head and the blood spills onto the camera lens under his face. Like it's hard to describe, but if you've seen it. You know what I mean? Like awesome. And the blood just like fills up the screen. I love that. That's such a great shot. And she's screaming help and she's trying to get out. She opens the, the uh, windows, one of the windows and there's gates like a grate on it. So she can't get out bars on the windows. <laughs> All the windows have bars. All the doors are locked. This is crazy. You can't hold us prisoner. And then we find out it is Maximilian. And he just takes whatever it is again. It's like a wooden something. I don't know. And starts beating her, Sophie, to death. And we get a cool little effect that it's like a camera trick. that It's something you did with the camera. that You zoomed in on the aftermath, but it blurs. I don't know, it's weird, but it, it, it it's unique. It's like, instead of showing actually, like, what happened, like the aftermath of the kill, blood and whatever, it, it, it just blurs it out faintly. I don't know, it's a stylistic choice. I don't know how I feel about it, but it, it's, it's unique, it's cool. So then we see Leandro with the dummy of Carlos, and his face is broken, and he just said it was newly... Uh, molded this morning and it broke already so maximilian was beating up like him like the fake like a dummy and thought it was the real carlos or he actually killed the real carlos again in this loop in this turn of events and then leandro as the devil is left over with the dummies which represent them being dead and then he until the loop starts again and Lisa or Elena comes back another doppelganger will come and repeat this process all over again that's what I've always kind of taken from this so let me know your theories and stuff Baba fans let me know what your interpretation of this whole movie is <laughs> I mean you're here in mind for like almost an hour so let me know what uh, your interpretations of what actually goes on in this movie who what exactly who exactly is Leandro is he in fact the devil himself like, I don't know. Leave any thoughts on this movie. I'd love to read anything to do with Leeds and the Devil. <laughs> I think it's hilarious when Leandro's talking to the mannequin and he's saying, like, it's almost like he's talking to him. And then he's talking about him. Uh, he, like, starts laughing at a joke that I guess he heard from the dummy of Carlos saying, like, a man that's losing his head. Ha <laughs> ha, that's great. A man losing his head, like, over a woman. Funny. Like, I don't know, like, I mean, corny, a little hokey nowadays, but still, it made me chuckle. And I love how he name drops himself, almost, pretty much. Like, when he says, like, well, what is um, tradition to an, a poor devil like me? Love that. Just the fact that in, they put it, he put it in there for him to say, call himself a devil. Makes it, just that little detail may, is cute. Like, I really like that. And then Leandro says to unconscious uh, Lisa that he has another puppet to make. And fortunately, it looks just like you. And, like, you won't be here uh, this time tomorrow, that's for sure. So, Devil's going to try to do Lisa in. And that's when we find out that through the Countess talking and having... We get a little flashback, but... The Carlos was married to the Countess, and he left, and he came back, not for the Countess, but he came back for Elena. And that's the whole love triangle, I guess, that kickstarts this loop, and that it keeps recurring over and over again. I'm guessing with a different doppelganger every time, like it was Elena one time, now it was Lisa, then it'll be another one, but the name really doesn't matter, because in the end, the Maximilian stuff, they always still call her Elena. So I guess it's just going to be a girl that looks exactly like her every whatever amount of time, and it just loops itself over and over again. Like, this is their form of hell. And then I like when Lisa wakes up, and she's with Leandro there, and then she has no idea what the hell's going on, and she sees Carlos 
sitting in the chair, the, the dummy. And she goes up like, it can't be. And she's saying, like, I saw him in his casket earlier at the chapel. And Leandra says, no, that's just a dress rehearsal. Like, she saw this dummy in the coffin. Like, <laughs> I like how he th- it makes sense, like, the story he gives her. Like, you could look at it that he's telling the truth, and this is all in her head. God damn it, some of the hallway shots look so gorgeous. And then others, just another a, a few shots later, like just look real dark and ominous. Like I love the setting here. And then Lisa runs into the Countess, who was leaning down in front of Sophie, who's dead. And good gore, man. I mean, a bloody as hell face. And then like the staff or whatever the hell they're using to smash people's faces in is stuck in their head and. Looks really good. Uh, then she runs like hell and says she's looking for Max. Like, she starts calling Max's name out. And the Countess meets up with Leandro, which is when we find out that she, uh, that Leandro tells the Countess that she is Miss Elena in person. So then Maximilian and uh, Elena meet up. And Elena says, and Leandro's like following close behind. And he ends up saying that she's prettier to him than Elena was. And ends up telling her about Elena. And then we get that awesome reveal, man, when he says, this is Elena, and pulls the uh, curtain back on the bed, and it's just her skeleton, skeletal remains and stuff. And she starts freaking out, and he's like, no, trust me, that's, see, she means nothing to me. She means nothing. Like, you mean everything to me. What a fucking psychopath, man. And then Maximilian, he don't chloroform her, yo. And I love, right after he chloroforms, the, the, the score. That composition right here in this scene, specifically. Love that score. Just, like, nice, amazing, uh, like, neon classical uh, acoustic guitar. Great stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. Then he starts creepily, like, undressing her. And she has, like, this crazy, like, bra on. Like, I don't, I don't even know what it's called. Like, women who've seen this movie, let me know. It's, it's weird looking. And, um, like, any good gentleman proceeds to rape her. Like, I'm pretty sure that's what's implied, right? That he rapes her? Because then she's just, like, completely naked, and his shirt's off, and he's laying, like, halfway on bed, and she's, like, unconscious almost. Like, that's he raped her, right? Like, they don't show it, of course. Like, I don't know. That's what I always took from it. Oh, yeah, I spoke too soon. Yeah, he, he does rape her. But he's also crying hysterically and shit while having raping her. Like, <laughs> I, it's a fucking weird scene. It's disturbing though, because then he starts like laughing and shit, like maniacally while that, and then it gets super disturbing because then it pulls back and you see Elena's. They're doing it right next to the skeletal corpse of Elena, <laughs> and he's looking at the corpse, the skeleton, while like it's a disturbing fucking scene, man. And then, man, the sound design you shines here. Because then you hear, like, Elena's, like, voice, I guess, like, cackling and laughing and the echo on it. it. It sounds fantastic. And then the Countess reveals that um, Maximilian killed Elena. Because she says that, um, I never should, should have let you meet her. And like, now look what you've done. It's like, just like you hurt, uh, hurt Elena, or just like you did to Elena. So, and then he justifies it by saying that, like, what, what she, I did to her. What about what she ran off with your husband? Like, the mom's husband. And like, and then she says, why did you do this? Now people are going to come looking for these people. And he said they were trying to take my Lisa away. So, I mean, this guy's fully fucking delusional, like, straight up psychotic. Yeah, then she's saying, like, you know, uh, the only way for you uh, to be all right is if Lisa goes away. And then she's like, tell me you love me, darling. And like, so I was over, th- I was misremembering, like, it's not as incestual, the relationship between them. that I'm remembering, maybe I'm thinking of Butcher Baker, uh, Nightmare Maker for some reason. But there is definitely a weird relationship between them. And then he ends up stabbing her to death. Like, she, like, leans forward onto the sword that he's holding or whatever it is. And now Countess is dead. Oh, God, I want this staircase, man. Like, oh, the the hand-carved wood and everything. It's kind of like my bedpost and shit. Like, just the hand-carved wood. Indonesia, bro. That's where? Indonesia. You need wood. I get a few. Mad cheap. On the cheap, on the cheap. So then Maximilian walks into the dining room and all the corpses 
are sitting at the dining room table, and then the mom, the countess, walks in, and she starts walking towards her, and the red lighting is looks fantastic on her, and she looks creepy as shit, but I'll get to wondering what this is about in a minute. What a great fucking shot when the mom's, uh, the countess is walking towards Maximilian and then he looks over at the dining room table and all the corpses are turned their heads, including the skeletal remains of Elena. Awesome. One of my favorite shots in this movie. And then he falls out the window, Maximilian, he dies and the countess is dead and Leandro comes and looks at all the carnage. Gorgeous room. The next shot, uh, the next scene when, um, Lisa's waking up naked in the bedroom, and there's all the branches and leaves and, like, vines and shit in the room. Awesome. Looks really, really awesome. Uh, then Lisa's walking out outside, and uh, then she hears Maximilian's voice saying, Lisa, Lisa, we'll always be together. Don't leave me. And when she looks, it's a mannequin, a dummy of Maximilian. Another thing to uh, put a pen in for a sec. So then also, put a pin in this, but then the kids that are playing, uh, like with the blanket or whatever, and they're throwing the soccer ball in the air, they see her, uh, Lisa, pick up the ball when it rolls out of bounds or whatever. She picks it up, and they say, oh, stay away. She's a ghost. Everybody knows that. Nobody's lived in there for 100 years. So no one's lived in the house for 100 years, and everyone knows she's a ghost. So then... She walks off, and Leandro ends up, uh, she throws the ball, the ball rolls, and right near uh, Leandro's feet, and it you know, pans up, it's him. And then a dummy that looks just like Lisa is brought into frame, and it's the guy who makes him, I guess, who's um, holding it to him, saying, here, it's the best I can do at such short notice. And he says, I think it's a bit late. And she gets on the plane. And then we have the ending here. But she starts noticing the aircraft is starting to look a little empty. A little suspiciously. Dun, 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 dun. First of all, the sound design in this ending scene, too, is phenomenal. With the heartbeat sound that's getting faster and faster, more anxious that she's getting as she's walking through the plane. Nobody's there. Excellent. And then, boom, we get it. She screams. And no. And then we see... All the corpses, or all the dead people from that night, Francis, Sophie, George the driver, the Countess, Maximilian sitting together, and Carlos behind them, all on the plane. And she freaks out, has no idea what's going on. And I love the way that they shot that, too. I love the way how on it she goes, no, and then it shoots on each zoom-in shot on each of the people, of the dead people. Just psh, psh. Oh, awesome. I love how that shot. And then she goes to the cockpit, cockpit, cockpit door and then opens the door. And then we get the reveal that Leandro is the pilot flying this plane. And we get a shot back at her and she turns into the dummy version of her and falls to the ground. And then it freeze frames on Leandro's face after he's sucking on his lollipop that he sucks on throughout this whole movie. And then credits roll over his face. Awesome. Now, what is the fuck does all of this mean? <laughs> I want to hear theories. For anyone who stumbles upon this, the few of you who are uh, fellow Italian horror fans, what happens here? So, we know that Elena and Lisa are linked. That Lisa's like a doppelganger, like I said, of Elena. So, no one's lived there for a hundred years. That line sticks out. So, that means that that house is haunted. And, like I was hinting at earlier, that I'm guessing Leandro is the devil. And, like it says about the, uh, the mural, the painting at the very beginning, with the, with the face of looks like Leandro's face, but what's supposed to be the devil, and that he delivers, you know, and takes away the dead. So, we see that he, as in the chapel, when we see Carlos's, uh, when Lisa sees Carlos's uh, dummy, as he says, in the casket, that that's being, you know, a dress rehearsal, as he puts it, for the actual burial. 
So he's kind of like a mortician also. Now, are all these people dead and they're basically living in hell or a purgatory-like steak? Steak? A purgatory steak. I would love to see what that tastes like. But a purgatory-like state. And that's maybe why it ends here on the airplane. This is like they're the only ones, you know, in their little realm, their little ghost world or whatever, alternate dimension, whatever you want to talk, call it. But in the house, there's only the souls of them, of them, nobody else. And he's at the cockpit. He controls it all. So, as I said also earlier, it doesn't mean that since Elena got a doppelganger in Lisa, a few years go by maybe, uh, then Lisa has a doppelganger. There's another woman who looks just like Lisa and Elena. She comes and she ends up getting into that same situation. That's what I've always took from it. But there's so many different ways you can go at, with this, trying to interpret what this movie means. But yeah, 1974's Lisa and the Devil by Mario Bava might be my favorite Bava film. Like, it's pretty much a toss up between this and Kill Baby Kill when I really think about it. I don't know which one I put higher, but it's definitely in a mind fuck of a movie. So. Those of you out there, Bava fans, let me know your interpretation for everything we were talking about. Is he really the devil? Like, the devil? Or is he a servant of the devil? Does he own all their souls? And that's why they're on the airplane at the end? What's with the dummies? Like, let's hear it. You've been watching JT's Horror Discussions. 600th video. Thanks, guys. Wherever you're from, hope you're having a good morning, afternoon, or night. And I will talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.